mentors, the staff and volunteers. We've been here for 25. We plan on being here for another 25 more years and uh, most definitely trying to see a lot of you young ones, our participants and students. Maybe you guys will be up here someday doing this for us. So we get to do this because we're Americans. We have freedoms. We have people fighting for our rights. Let's all stand up and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody look to the east, which is this way. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Awesome. All right, again, thank you everybody for coming today. We have a total of 18 teams from Wisconsin, Illinois, and Ohio currently. We did have a higher number, but unfortunately with uh, the first week of May, we ran into AP testing, uh, several proms, uh, school trips, and whatnot with everybody trying to impact from getting out of COVID. So thank you all for being here today. Next year, I expect us to be back up over our 40 team mark. So stay, stay alert, stay ahead, and uh, we'll be getting there. Uh, if I can have everyone wear a red shirt, stand on up, our Rockets for Schools Committee. Carol, no running away. Carol. Everybody in a red shirt, please stand up. Rockets for Schools. These are our planning committees. And the lady with the speed boot on there is Carol. She's my co-director. So like I said, if you're looking to resolve an issue, look for Carol, look for myself. Carol, uh, Carol always seems to get hurt the week of Rockets for School. So we always see her zooming around in a boot or something else. So thanks, Carol. Um, Barb, you wanted to mention something? Barb Bishop, one of our, uh, our treasurer's secretary, wanted to, uh, a couple minutes on the microphone, so I'm not sure what she's doing, but I've been told it'll be a surprise. It's a box. Yeah, be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> You need me to help with anything? No. Um, I'm not. Do I have to press the button? Nope. Okay. Speaking? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm not a real good speaker, but, you know, I'm the one that always thanks the advisors and for their, their work. And because this is our 25th anniversary, I thought we had, I had to do something for the Rocket Committee. I know he always says, makes us stand up, say thank you, but these guys have been wonderful to work with. We have had so many challenges over these past three years, as you have. And <clears throat> we have worked together and we have solved it and tried to make this as, as good as it could be under the circumstances. And I want the, advise, the uh, Rocket Committee to come up here. Um, so that's, uh, of course, me. Um, Bob, unfortunately, he's out checking your rockets. Uh, and um, Frank went home sick. He's also with Tripoli. And Bob is, oh, I said Bob already. Brian is not here. So Carol, Randy, Diane is not here. Eric, I think he's out also with the rockets. Uh, Jason, he's not here, but I did see David. Um, if David can come up here. Meredith, and of course, Peggy. Peggy, get your buns up here. Um, these, these people have, I have learned so much over these years. I'm not going to get emotional. Stop crying. Um, anyway, I just think I have gifts for them, little special ones. And I think that they deserve a standing ovation. Please stand. So you can grab your, your gifts. Um, there is a little extra surprise in there. I hope somebody wins something. <laughs> just grab one? Yeah, just grab one. And I'll keep the rest for the other ones when they come back from their rockets. So, all right, I think we're back to Ken.
Thank you, Barb, very much appreciated. We all very much enjoyed doing this. There's some days we, you know, I've got engineer's head, so if anyone's an engineer understands what this is, you know, you end up going bald, rubbing your hair off, trying to fight and solve problems. So again, thank you again, everybody, for being here in our committee. Uh, we'll cover some of the other challenges that we've, we've had over the past year. And uh, while I wait for the items to load here. So uh, we also want to make sure, take some time, everybody, part of your passport program that we'll talk about, is check with the vendors, check with the exhibitors. We have Loke Precision, we have Sierra Nevada, Wisconsin DOT, UW-Green Bay, Sheboygan, and a plethora of other vendors and exhibitors here. Take the time to talk to them. They're taking their time out of their day to be here and to give you the opportunities of what can happen. So take the time, spend the time, and I would appreciate it. All the volunteers, there are some additional volunteers that will be around here. There, there, there are those, excuse me, there are those guys that have taken your rockets away already. They're the people that will take your rockets out to the pier. They'll be the people that help load your rockets. There's just a whole army of red shirts that you don't see right now off campus doing a bunch of stuff. And I think as most of you have seen out there, half the pier is missing. And uh, there's about 400 feet of the pier that's missing. We are actually shuttling your rockets out by a pontoon boat. And uh, we've nicknamed the portion of the pier that is out there and completed the Island of Misfit Rockets. So if you hear me talk about it, those of you that understand the Island of Misfit toys from the Christmas shows, um, it's our little spin on trying to have some fun. So there's going to be some more safety talks as we go. And uh, most of all, just be alert, be heads up, and be smart. Teachers and volunteer, uh, teachers and mentors, excuse me, moms and dads, teachers, mom, dads, stand on up. You guys get your ovations. Mentors and teachers, stand on up. All right, guys, give them their round of applause. <laughs> Without them getting 20 emails from Barb on forms and payments and with me saying, hey, you can't do this, you got to do that, plan for that. Um, it's made for, I'm sure, several long nights, several, some days of no sleep, but uh, you guys are here because they're behind the scenes getting you here, and please don't forget that. Don't be afraid to give them a handshake and thank them, thank the volunteers, and thank the exhibitors. All right, at this time, we are obviously guests of the Blue Harbor Resort, and I'd like to ask Sue Engler, their general manager, to come up and say a few words. So, Sue? Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Blue Harbor in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Everybody having a good time? Yes. How many have been here before? Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are glad that you're here. So we're so glad that you got your teams together. You worked really hard for this event, and I know there's a lot of uh, the community ready to watch your rockets being launched tomorrow, so it's an exciting time for you all. I just want to tell you a little bit about Blue Harbor. Um, as you might know, the hospitality industry through COVID um, was hit hard, but we are all back here, and we're very excited to be here. Um, I have over 300 employees here that are creating memorable experiences for you and all our guests, and we are really busy and going to be very busy this summer with all our family um, resorters coming back for the summer. So we are very excited. Um, Blue Harbor has a conference center, which you're all enjoying here, and of course the resort rooms, villas, and then our water park, which I'm, I know that you're going to be in there later today. So our team is ready. Uh, for you to come when, after your event today. So I think I have strict instructions that you're all supposed to stay here and with your teams and enjoy the day and then join us later tonight in the water park. So we're, our team is ready. So just like you, we have teams here too. And teams are very important. And I'm sure that you recognize that because each one of you have contributions in your own to the cause that you're working on with your project. We too have teams here that work really hard together. And if you can learn that concept well and really appreciate the contributions to your individual team members to the overall goal, you really are going to learn a valuable lesson in life as you go on. So our teams here work very hard. We're mission here. 
um, is to create memorable experiences. And we're just really appreciative that Rockets for Schools is here. So thank you again for being here. Enjoy the resort. Our team is ready to serve you and answer any questions that you may have while you're here. And we look forward to tomorrow, because I know there, that's going to be an exciting time. And I know there's people coming down to the Peer District to watch. So enjoy. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes, Sue, thank you again for you and your team for supporting us. All right, here's, here's another fun part I like to do. Team introductions. We don't always have time to talk to each other. We always don't know who everybody is. So what I like to do is I call your school name and your team. If you could please stand up and wave to the crowd so they know who you are, and then you'll get to see who else everyone is. So Woodworth Middle School, the Eliminator, standing up. Wave to the crowd. So here's Woodworth Middle School. Our next club in the Class 1 Junior, Class 1 Senior category is the Star Splitters 4-H group. Russ and your team, where are you at? Thank you. Wave at the crowd. Autograph sessions, by the way, can be in the hallway if you need to sign them later. Our next team is Kingdom Prep Rocket Power. Kingdom Prep, stand on up, say that to the crowd. They're the shy guys in the back. Hey, guys. <laughs> All right, thanks for being here, guys and gals. Dodgeville High School, Dart Juan, Dodgeville, Dart Juan, wave up, say hi to everybody. One of the new teams that have joined us and hopefully will be here for the next 25 years at least, Baker Demonstration, Soil Ship. And if I slaughter your payload names, I apologize, but uh, Aaron School stand up, the Mallow Knots. Cromrie Middle School, Static Fanatics. Step on up. There you go. Wave at everybody. Also from Baker Demonstration, the Moisture Machine. Stand on up. There you go. Wave at everybody. Come on. There you go. Then our last class one team, Kiwaska Middle School, CSSC. I don't remember the full acronym. Sorry. All right, our class two, our big boys, the big rockets, the larger payloads from all the way from Ohio, Northview Engineering, Bladeo, Bladio, I think I've got that wrong, but Bladio, let's hear it. Another team from Northview brought four teams. So this is the second team. Second team's Iditarod. They're working with an ice cube, if I remember. Iditarod. Also from Dodgeville High School, Dart 2, the second team, Class 2 team, Dart 2. Shawano Community High School, the Water Wizards. There you go. Fresh from a run at Student Launch Initiative a couple weeks ago. Madison West, Biosphere 3, wave to the group. There you go. And then there were three, Oshkosh West High School. The rocket is no yoke. All right. Northview Engineering, Trapped Signals. I like the suits and ties, guys. That's cool. And uh, last but not least, Kewaskum High School Electro Bros. All right, now comes the fun part that I have to just remind everybody. Again, you, you've heard me over the years, and every year it's the same thing from, from Mr. B. Safety. Please always pay attention to the ongoing activities, be it the rocket launch, 
be at the presentation, be the activities going on in here. Especially Saturday, make sure you dress for the event. Sheboygan, wait five minutes and the weather will change. Tomorrow it's supposed to be a winds out of the north, northeast at 10 to 15, which means it's going to be cold. So it's supposed to be 58 with sunshine, but a wind chill factor of maybe 45. So please prepare and plan for the weather. Again, pay attention. Safety, safety, safety. Look up, look around. Be responsible for yourself and your teams. Team advisors, parents, and mentors, you are responsible for your teams. So please, if they decide to go out and do an activity, make sure there's an adult with them, or you know where they are, or you could call them back at any time. If anyone's been outside, you understand that the drive circle that we normally launch from and observe from is currently cordoned off with some orange fencing and barrels. Do not go in those areas, okay? If any member of your team is caught within those orange barriers, you'll be on the next Greyhound home, okay? That's how serious it is. We worked six months with Michael's Construction, the Corps of Engineers in the city of Sheboygan, just to be here today to launch off the pier. And we're still not done. We had to buy some additional materials, protective items, and things like that. So it's, we've put a lot of effort to make sure this works. We just don't need anybody wandering in behind the orange fence. If you guys can do that for me and gals do that for me this week, we'll all be very, very, very happy. So thank you. Um, member safety again. We'll be talking about launching tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk about the RSO table, where everything is located, the processes, and we'll cover that all later tonight. Oh, did I miss the waterbenders? I am sorry. Northview waterbenders, stand on up. My apologies. <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. My apologies, guys. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I don't know, I'll thank you later, I guess. But uh, really apologize. I, I'm so excited Dart was here, or Dodgeville was here. I skipped you guys. My, my apologies. But yes, thank you for being here, by all means. Tonight, before we dispart, and tomorrow morning, we again will talk about safety. We're going to talk about the processes of getting your rockets out, outside at the uh, range safety officer table. How are you going to put in your payloads, motors, and things like that? So we'll cover that a little bit later. But essentially, you're not going to be touching your rocket till tomorrow when it's your launch time. Um, again, we are the guests of the Blue Harbor Resort, city of Sheboygan. And most of all, I mentioned the Corps of Engineers and Michael's Construction. All these entities have worked to let us be here today to fly and be safe. And again, stay out of the orange marked fence areas and the barrels. I don't want to send anybody home. I don't want to be the mean, grumpy guy. I want everyone to have a good time. All right, event schedule. All the mentors and everybody should have an event schedule. There's one tweak in there that I didn't catch on the final edit. Lunch is actually from 11.45 to 1.15. It says 12.45 to 1.15. I know students eat fast, but that's too short for today. So it's actually 11.45 to 1.15. It's basically when we're done with our keynote speaker until about 1.15. So again, 10 o'clock is our ceremonies. 10.30 is our keynote speaker, Mr. Grunsfeld. Uh, we'll have lunch here at 11.45 to 1.15. Team presentations are from 115 to about 445. All the mentors, you were sent a copy of that schedule. If you need another copy, please let me know. I have another set. Um, Nikki, if you want to stand up there. Nikki is going to be your uh, rodeo herder, cat herder, whatever term you want to use. She'll be queuing you in the hallways and such for that time. The presentations, if everyone goes out the back doors here, you turn to your right. You go to the end of the hallway and you turn right again. There's another hallway that will take you to the side dining room. Class 1, you're going to be on the bottom of the dining hall. In class 2, you're up in the mezzanine in the uh, bar, area, bar area. There are no drinks, sorry. But uh, well, that's where our presentations are. Again, a reminder, one mentor or one adult can be with the team. No videotaping, recording any of the presentations. Okay, team presentations, please be prepared and ready. We've got a 15-minute window for each team. That 15-minute window is for you to walk in there, get set up, be prepared. Do your, you know, If you're using a PowerPoint to get it in and running, you're judged on your 5 to 10-minute period for your presentation. That's the time part of it. But the 15 minutes keeps us moving through the whole session and timing for everybody, okay? So it's up to you to be there, prepared, ready and queued, ready to rock and roll. 
Uh, I mentioned class one, class two, where you are. Display boards and payloads, we're asked that all the time. It's up to you. Whatever you can do to convey your design, your payload, your thought process should go with you. So if you want to take your display board and your payload with you, please do. Just please make sure it gets back here so we can judge the displays at that time. Again, your presentation time that you're judged on is five to ten minutes. And then again, one team member, one adult advisor or uh, adult in there. Payload teching. This is the one that I usually get deer in the headlights when I mention this. We have standard safety standards that have been built into the rocket kits themselves. Class 1, Class 1 Senior, your maximum payload weight is 1.5 pounds. Class 2, you cannot exceed 2 pounds. That is your entire payload. So if you have water, if you have an apple, you have an egg, a marshmallow, a uh, set of batteries, everything cannot exceed that amount. Okay? We will tech you. We do have a scale over here. So when your payloads, if you're coming back or tomorrow morning, make sure you check with me to get them weighed, double check, because you can't fly them until we double check the weight. Any questions on that? It's a pretty straightforward setup. I think everyone's there anyway. Payload post-launch assessment review, the PPLAR. This is a remnant from uh, the student launch initiative where they take and evaluate, did your payloads actually work? We've incorporated this over the past couple of years, and it's a program that I help manage with the Lakeshore Area Rocket Society. We like to know if your payloads worked. If they didn't, so what? We want to know the pros and cons. Now, there's a, there's a side note to that. Using the PPLAR allows us to reach out to other organizations for sponsorship. They ask us, how do you evaluate your event? By the number of PPLARs we get. You know, how the comments we get by emails. But this is a, a true gauge, an indicator to say, hey, they're doing a good job. Our, our, our system did this. So please take the time to fill it out. We even have a monetary bonus for this. If you fill it out and get it to me before the assigned dates, you get $25 off for your class one rocket next year, and you get a $50 credit for your class two. All right, everybody should have a student badge. You have your stream and your support roles are on there. So as we call you during the course of the day, you know, Enterprise, you need to go where, Mercury needs to go where, Apollo needs to go where. Take a look at that, follow that, and that is your guide and your tool for the next two days. Passports, door prizes. As you know, we give out a bunch of door prizes at the end. SpaceX sent us some water bottles. Uh, there's a T-shirt. There's a bunch of other items that we've gotten as well. So you're, each one of you have a passport exploration booklet. Um, what you do, the whole point is, that again, to interact with our exhibitors or vendors and such and get the little stamp on there, turn in your completed passport, and you're in the basket for the door prizes. Tonight at about 5 o'clock, we will have our launch support presentation. So we'll go over pad safety, mission control, the teching, and tracking. Just before that, we're very fortunate enough that we have several of the teams from last year's event. As you recall, most of us did virtually, and we had two separate days of launching at Bong. We have your trophies over there today, the big green trophies that we're going to hand out to the teams for their participation last year that we couldn't do. All right, and I want to remind everybody too, I was asked, uh, a couple birdies came up here and asked, the Wi-Fi for here, if you look at, the, at the, uh, your Wi-Fi system, it should be Blue Harbor Conference is the Wi-Fi you want to use here. And the password for that is pretty simple, it's Blue Meetings with an S. So if you're looking to get on Wi-Fi, it's Blue Harbor Conference, Blue Meetings with an S. And then live streaming, we are live streaming already. If you want to let anybody know that uh, um, they want to hook in and follow the event, they can do so by going to YouTube and just simply in the search button put in Rockets for Schools and uh, live, and they should be able to find it. Okay, any questions so far? I know it's a lot of information, a lot of rules and stuff, but we all do that to make sure we are impacting and having a good time. So any questions? All right, so we're going to take about two, three minutes here to get uh, Mr. Grunsfeld set up on his laptop, and we will roll into his presentation. So everybody can just sit still for a couple minutes, and uh, we'll be right back. Hang on.
All right, that was quicker than what we expected. So is everybody back? All right, sounds good. Well, this is your third, fourth time here. Fourth time back here for uh, Mr. John. John Mace Grunsfeld, PhD, is President and CEO of Endless Frontier Associates, astronaut, astrophysicist, explorer. Um, we have uh, a couple quick items. He asked me not to read his complete bio, but he is a veteran of five space shuttle flights, STS-67, 81, 103, 109, and 125. Three of those flights were to the Hubble Space Telescope. So with the James E. Webb, uh, Webb scope now in, in the uh, news, this is very, very key to that timing. One of the big items we want to talk about is that Mr. Grunsfeld was the last human to touch Hubble. And at the same time, Mr. Grunsfeld is from the Chicago area, now lives in Colorado, is well known as the Hubble repairman, and has, does the call in the NPR radio called Car Talk. So let's get it here for Mr. John Grunsfeld. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm really happy to be back at Rockets for Schools, especially given all of the challenges that we've had the last couple of years. Um, you know, every every year or so, I'll talk to Carol Lutz about you know whether I can make it, and you know, some years I've been able to make it, and some years, well, quite frankly, I've been in Earth orbit and haven't been able to to come. But uh, one of the reasons I really love this event is because as a kid. I loved to, to launch model rockets, and I launched a lot of rockets. I lost a lot of rockets, none quite as large as, as the ones that you're launching, although I've flown on one slightly larger. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is tell you a little bit about my story very briefly. I grew up in uh, a little suburb of Sheboygan called Chicago, the south side of Chicago. And uh, back then we used to get big big storms, and uh, this is a picture of me in 1967 pretending to be an Arctic explorer, or maybe Antarctic explorer. Um, and this is about the time that uh, I declared to my mother that I wanted to be an astronaut. And prior to that, I wanted to be a commercial trucker, because I thought driving big trucks was cool. And she thought that was great, uh, not because there's anything wrong with driving a truck, but because she thought I would then be interested in, in science and engineering. Um, and in fact, you know, I became an astrophysicist so that it did drive. Uh, but she was also thinking, and there's no chance he'll ever become an astronaut, so she wouldn't have to worry about that. And this is 1967, the time uh, that we hadn't gone to the moon yet. We were still flying around uh, in Earth orbit, and we're getting ready to go to the moon, which we did, of course, in 1969. Um, so I did become a scientist. Uh, I went to the University of Chicago for graduate school and built payloads that went on very high altitude balloons. And also, my uh, PhD thesis flew on Space Shuttle Challenger in 1985. So that was my first introduction uh, to actually human space flight. And uh, it was very interesting because it was very hard to work with NASA. And so our mantra was to try and involve the astronauts as little as possible uh, and make our, our payload automatic. Um, I went on then to work on rocket payloads um, after graduate school, and this is a, a rocket I worked on that we launched from Japan. Uh, so I did get to launch a few rockets a little bigger than uh, the, the Class Twos. Uh, and then in 1992, was selected as an astronaut. Um, and you know, I'm really excited to see uh, all of the young women here and young men, all of you interested in rocketry, in building payloads, in the science experiments you have. Um, some of them look really exciting. You know, if I think about what I would have liked to have had in space, I think chocolate-covered marshmallows would have been pretty high on that list. So a shout out to the, the marshmallow team. Um, there are some things that I'm glad we didn't have in space. Uh, so take a look at the cockroaches out there that are, that are going to launch. You know, so they'll have an exciting ride. Um, and I'm glad they're on you know, a, a sounding rocket and not on a space shuttle or the space station. That would be bad. Um, but I had a really exciting career. I did get to fly five times in space, 58 days, uh, and the most fun of all was to go out and do spacewalks. It's a little crazy, um, and I'll talk about that. Before uh, I get to that, I want to talk a little about NASA's mission and, and why we do what we do on, on your behalf. 
um, and hopefully to excite you all to, to want to be astronauts. So at this stage, how many of you would actually like to go to space? Okay, so of those folks who would like to go to space, and I highly encourage it, it's uh, very risky. You know, the outcome is unknown, but it's very exciting. Uh, how many of you would like to go to the moon? How about Mars? Yeah, lots of hints for Mars. Mars would be just awesome. So NASA's mission, uh, there's a mission statement, and you can go look it up online. I can never remember it. The way I think of it is NASA's job is to innovate, to create new technologies to allow us to explore space, to allow us to make better aircraft. Um, and when we innovate and invent things, it gives us the ability to go out and explore. Uh, and I think that's what humans do really uniquely, is we go out and we explore. We explore our planet, we explore into the oceans, high mountains, and into space. And when we explore, we discover things. Uh, and, you know, that's, I think our brains are hardwired to want to discover things. Uh, that's why, you know, we're so creative, as well as opposable thumbs, and so successful on planet Earth. And when we discover things and communicate those discoveries to other folks, uh, we inspire uh, the nation and the world. Science at NASA, which is something that I've been very involved in, uh, the last uh, 10 years I was uh, the head of science for NASA at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Not as much fun as space flight, but still a lot of fun. We get to answer big scientific questions. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Are we alone? So where did we come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did the chemical elements that were built out of come from? Where did the Earth come from? Solar systems, our sun, our galaxy. Where are we going? Uh, what's the future trajectory of planet Earth? Uh, unless we change our behavior, it's not very good. Um, you know, climate change is a big deal. And you know, I saw in some of the payloads uh, topics addressing that. Uh, where are we going as people? Are we going to go to the moon? I think the answer is yes. Are we going to go to Mars? I think the answer is yes. Will we ever make it? to a planet around a nearby star. That's really far. Um, one of my astronaut friends said she's helping uh, some writers of a new movie. And the uh, chief writer said, hey, hey, in our movie, we want it to take 15 years for the astronauts to get to the nearest planet. And I said, well, if you travel at the speed of light, you might be able to do that. But more likely, it will be thousands of years for somebody to leave the Earth and get to a nearby star system if we invent new propulsion, which is all of your jobs, fusion drives or antimatter drives. Um, the distances in space are so vast. Um, but I think someday we will make it uh, to another planet system around a nearby star. And then the big question, which may seem out of place here, but are we alone in the universe? And for the first time in human history, we have both the means and the technology to make that a scientific question. We have the Perseverance rover on Mars that's collecting samples in an ancient lake bed, an ancient river delta and lake bed, to see if there was ever life on Mars in the ancient past, three and a half billion years ago. Uh, we're sending a mission to Europa, a moon around Jupiter, uh, that may be able to see if there might be life on an ocean underneath the ice on Europa. And we just launched the James Webb Space Telescope, which might be able to look at planets around nearby stars and see if there's any hints of life on those planets. And so we may get the answer to that question. So again, uh, for all of you, how, how many of you think that there is life or must be life somewhere else besides Earth? You know, it just seems that if we're the only life in the whole universe, that you know, even in our own galaxy, there are 40 million planets, scientists estimate, astronomers estimate, 40 million planets like Earth. You know, it would just be so odd if we're the only ones out there. And so it's so exciting that NASA science uh, is at the point where we can maybe answer this question in the next decade. What's also remarkable is with telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, ground-based telescopes, other NASA observatories, We've been able to tell the story of the universe from almost the very beginning, the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, through the evolution of uh, matter in the universe. You know, the chemical elements that were made out of were built inside of stars and inside of exploding stars uh, that formed galaxies. 
we've uh, learned the life cycle of stars from the collapse of gas and dust to the initiation of fusion energy inside of that baby star. And we've learned that planetary systems form at about the same time that stars turn on. I'll talk about that in a little bit. We've learned that the universe is expanding. That's what Ed Edwin Hubble discovered, for which the Hubble Space Telescope is named. And we've learned that galaxies regularly collide and cause new star formation. But also that the universe is not only expanding, it's accelerating. Now, it's pretty cool that we've been able to tell the story from the beginning of the universe. We don't know why the universe started, but from the beginning of the universe to when the first stars formed, and that's what James Webb is going to look at, through the expansion of the universe, through the formation of our solar system four and a half billion years ago, to the evolution of planet Earth, early biology. And so, you know, I feel pretty good that science has answered all these questions. But just to give you the perspective, because of the uh, acceleration of the universe, and also a thing called dark matter, it turns out that everything we know about, everything that we're made out of, everything stars are made out of, the dust in the galaxy, all of that matter and light that we see accounts for only 4% of the known universe. And dark energy and dark matter, uh, which is the rest that we think we know about, uh, we have no idea what it is. So there's a lot of work for scientists still to do. So the Hubble Space Telescope played a key role in a lot of the discoveries in astronomy over the last uh, 32 years that it's been in space, you know, older than you. In fact, half of the world's population has never known a world without the Hubble Space Telescope. So you are the Hubble generation, for sure. Um, and it's still going strong. And the reason why uh, it's doing well, it's not a particularly big telescope, but because it's in Earth orbit. It's above the atmosphere. So when you go out at night, and uh, probably not tonight, I think it's going to be cloudy, but if you look up at the night sky, you see that stars twinkle. Well, they don't twinkle because stars twinkle. They twinkle because our atmosphere has disturbances that cause the stars to be you know, twinkly. Um, the light is scattered through our atmosphere. If you get above the atmosphere, you know, then the stars are much clearer, and you can do much better imaging. Plus, some of the light from stars and galaxies and planets doesn't make it to the surface of the Earth, ultraviolet light. And that's good because otherwise, you know, we'd all get sunburned walking outside like instantly or you'd have to wear SPF 10 million or wear big floppy hats everywhere just to protect ourselves. But probably life wouldn't have evolved into us on Earth with, if we were baked by ultraviolet light. And we'd all be fishes and we wouldn't be able to launch rockets. Um, that'd be no fun. So the Hubble Space Telescope is up there and also even the biggest telescopes on Earth with the best motion control systems to point them at stars have jitter and things like that because the Earth is shaking. And so by the Hubble Space Telescope, by floating in orbit, orbiting the Earth, can take really steady pictures. And so that's what's allowed it uh, to do amazing things. But that wasn't always the case. When the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, its mirror was the wrong shape. Um, this was 1990, before most of you were born. And so the great observatory, the Hubble Space Telescope, wasn't even a very good observatory when it was launched. So it was uh, the source of a lot of comedy early on. And this is a cartoon, one of those cartoons, um, 1990, a picture of the moon looking like a peanut, Jupiter all distorted, Saturn with wavy rings, and very angry taxpayers. Um, but fortunately, the Hubble was designed to be fixed by astronauts from the very beginning people, women and men, working in space, in spacesuits. And so in 1993, we did the first mission to the Hubble Space Telescope on the space shuttle. They put in some new lenses to correct the vision. And since then, Hubble has been just an outstanding success. Now, things break in space. And so on subsequent missions, uh, we repaired the things that break. But more importantly, each time we went up, we put in new scientific instruments. And if you think about what kind of camera was available in 1990 when Hubble launched, you know, there were no cameras on your cell phones. There weren't even digital cameras that you could take pictures with. Uh, there were really old technology. And so each time we went up, we were able to put up new technology such that fortunately, even though our last mission was in 2009, we still have cameras that are better than your iPhone. You know, or other phone, Android phone. Um, 
So we have state-of-the-art instruments, and th that update is what's allowed Hubble to stay uh, current and make lots of discoveries. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my mission in 2009. This was uh, the final mission to the Hubble Space Telescope with the Space Shuttle, because we retired the Space Shuttle shortly after that. We had seven crew members. Uh, in the middle is Scott Altman. He's from Pekin, Illinois, central Illinois. He's an aerospace engineer. He was a Navy pilot. And there's a new movie coming out that's a remake of a uh, movie that probably nobody has ever seen. You know, I think it was in the theaters like four hours and then went away. Um, but it involved Navy uh, fighter pilots going to their school to learn how to dogfight. Um, anybody remember? Oh, yeah, Top Gun. It was called Top Gun. Um, and there was some actor who was in that film, and I don't think he ever appeared in any other films, um, who was like the protagonist in the film. Um, yeah, Tom Cruise. Any, nobody's heard of him, right? So anyway, Scott Altman was actually the pilot flying those scenes in the F-14 Tomcat uh, in Top Gun. Um, and the Navy actually had a deal with Paramount, the, the uh, production company, that the fighter pilots flying would actually get paid. Uh, you know, they're Navy pilots, you know, government employees, but because they were in the film, they got paid. But because Scott didn't have a speaking role, it was $15 a day. Uh, so Tom Cruise wasn't actually flying in that jet. And there's a particular scene where the Tomcat is inverted over a Russian MiG fighter. And uh, Scott Altman waved at the pilot. Um, if you've seen the film, he actually displayed a certain finger. But uh, so, so that was Scott's finger, not Tom Cruise's. Anyway, so that, that was uh, Commander. I had flown with Scott once before to Hubble, so we were good buddies. Um, to uh, Scott's left is our pilot, Greg Johnson, another aerospace engineer from the United States Navy. Uh, to his right is Megan MacArthur. She was our flight engineer and robotic arm operator. It was her first flight. I was on my fifth flight, my third to the Hubble. Next to me, all the way on the right, is Drew Feustel, a geological uh, exploration engineer uh, and physicist on his first flight. Um, all the way at the other end is Mike Massimino. He flew on the previous mission on Hubble with me, so I brought him back. And then Mike Good next to him, his spacewalking partner uh, on his first mission, uh, Air Force aerospace engineer. So we went out uh, in May of 2009. Uh, we had two space shuttles, Atlantis and Endeavour. Atlantis is what we were going to fly on. Endeavour was there to rescue us in case we had a problem. And can you crank up the volume? I hear it in the background. Okay, whoops. I'll try it again. All right, I'm going to pause just for a second to see if we can recover the sound. We did this in the practice. Sorry about this. You got it? Yeah, it's trying to put it through the uh, HDMI. See, this is a good lesson to be able to troubleshoot on the fly. Got anything? Yeah. Um, so we went out to launch. We had two vehicles. Uh, we had to make sure we went to the right vehicle. We wear those orange suits. Those are pressure suits in case we have to jump out. Seriously? The space shuttle is traveling Mach 10, 100,000 feet, and we're going to jump out. It's supposed to make us feel better. Um, we wear parachutes. Seriously, we're going to jump out at Mach 10. Um, but it makes us feel better. So anyway, uh, we get into Atlantis. That was Megan, the last one on. There are about 10,000 people that all have to do their job right to be able to successfully launch a rocket like the space shuttle. It will be the same for the space launch system with Orion. We'll see you back here in about 11 days. About six to eight seconds before launch, the main engines turn on. Those are liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engines, each with about a million and a half pounds of thrust. And then at liftoff, the solid rocket motors fire. Uh, there are bolts that blow. Even if the pyrotechnics doesn't blow the bolts off, the space shuttle will still take off, but it'll probably carry up concrete with it. Um, it's a really rough ride. This is not smooth. It's Mr. Toad's wild ride. 
And for the first two minutes on the solid rocket motors, which is what you're launching, uh, you know, kind of dicey, those come off and then it smooths out. The liquid fuel rocket really smooth. And for another six and a half minutes, uh, we're traveling to space. You can see our, our, that was a view from a cameras on the solid rocket motors. Um, once we get to space, we dump the big orange tank, that's the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tank, and uh, open the payload bay doors. The space shuttle was an incredible system, full, almost fully reusable. The only thing we didn't reuse was that orange tank. The solid rocket motors would, would parachute down into the ocean. We picked those up with a ship, cleaned them, put in new solid rocket fuel, stacked them back together, launched them again. Uh, and the space shuttle, of course, um, except for Columbia and Challenger that we tragically lost, uh, the space shuttle was entirely re reusable. And we flew 133 successful missions. Um, and so I think what SpaceX has done um, and what Rocket Lab has recently done with reusable rockets is really incredible. It's a great development. Um, but the space shuttle was the original reusable rocket. Um, more of the space shuttle system is reusable than the Falcon 9, for instance. Um, and of course, you know, we carried uh, 250 metric tons to orbit and back. Um, so, so those little rockets like the uh, Falcon 9 are really not much bigger than your, your rockets that you're launching out here. Um, we uh, flew up under uh, the Hubble Space Telescope using the computers on board, and then Scott Altman actually took the controls of uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis to do the final few feet underneath the Hubble so Megan MacArthur could reach out and grab the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is here. They have a couple of flight simulators. Um, and I encourage you in your free time to go over and practice flying some little airplanes. Megan MacArthur, prior to getting to space, had only flown the robotic arm on a computer, on a flight simulator. And so she was responsible for grabbing the $16 billion Hubble Space Telescope, her first flight in space, her first time operating the real robot arm. And uh, so I hope you can see she has kind of an intense focus there. Um, and she only had one shot to get it. You know, if she reached out and missed and like bumped the telescope, the telescope would start spinning and we'd have no Hubble today. So obviously, you know, she did a great job um, and grabbed the Hubble Space Telescope. We put Hubble in the payload bay and that allowed us to get ready to go spacewalking. This is a picture of my spacewalking partner, Drew Feustel and Mike Massimino. And a couple of things. One, you can see it's really crowded. And that's because we had seven people on the space shuttle. We had four spacesuits, which is like four additional big people. We also had uh, all of the gear we would need to repair the wings or the uh, thermal insulation, the thermal protection system on the shuttle in case it was damaged on launch. Um, tragically, in 2002, we, 2003, we lost Space Shuttle Columbia when it burned up on entry due to a hole in the wing that a piece of foam had created uh, on launch. And so we had to be prepared to fix that. So it was pretty crowded, and I was pretty happy to go outside and have a little room to stretch. Um, but Drew is wearing his spacewalking pajamas. Those are actually a, a suit that has tubes running through it, and cold water will circulate all through that to keep us cool in the suits. Another important thing about this picture is you can see Mike Massimino has a book in his hand, and that's a checklist. Uh, everything we did in space, we followed, well, all of the technical things, we followed a checklist because you'd hate to miss a step, you know, getting into the spacesuit, like forgetting to lock the helmet, right? You go outside and there's a big pop and your helmet goes away and you go, oops, and that's the last thing that ever happens to you. So you don't want to forget something like that. So we use checklists. And so I encourage you in your uh, payload preparation, if you haven't already done so, uh, when you get back from the water park, make a checklist to make sure you don't forget something, like forgetting to load the cockroaches, right? You don't want to forget to do that. So here's Drew and myself. We're in our space suits, all smiley, get, all ready to go. Our helmets are locked. Our gloves are locked on. Our tools are there, um, except Scott Altman is still in the airlock. And once we turn that handle with the, uh, the label there, whoosh, out goes all the air. And... Uh, Scott would love to do a spacewalk, but he didn't have a spacesuit, so we kicked him out because, among other things, we needed him to land at the end of the mission. And out, out I went. And 
This is what I absolutely love to do, is to go outside in a spacesuit. It's a vacuum outside. You can see the space shuttle wing in the background there. Um, that's the Earth reflected in my visor. Uh, the backpack has everything I need. It has oxygen, it has batteries, it has a canister with lithium hydroxide, which absorbs carbon dioxide. That's what we need here on Earth, is a huge lithium hydroxide canister. Um, but, you know, as you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide, and that would build up in the suit and could be toxic. Um, all of my tools are tethered because everything floats in space. You don't want to lose any tools. We have high and low beam headlamps. Those are cameras on top of those lights. We have three cameras. Um, so you'll be able to see some video from my spacewalks. And, you know, hopefully you can see a big grin on my face. And I had that grin almost all the time uh, that I'm in space. I'll tell you in a moment when I didn't have that grin. But, uh, you know, one of the things that explains what people had told me all of my life um, that I can say now is, yes, I do work in a vacuum. You know, people would ask, John, do you work in a vacuum? And yes, I do. Um, so this is a picture of, of Drew and myself outside on Hubble. So you get a sense of how big Hubble is. It's like a big Greyhound bus. That's me on the side there. And Drew is holding a wrench right now, a torque wrench. Uh, and he's playing with it because the main reason we went up was to put in a new super duper digital camera, the wide field camera three. And to do that, we had to remove the old camera and the bolt was stuck. Uh, apparently the previous astronauts who put it in in 1993 tightened it a little too hard. Um, and so we couldn't get the bolt unstuck using the torque wrench. Now a torque wrench, hope, how many of you know how to use a torque wrench? Yeah, lots of you, because you've been building things. And, uh, our particular torque wrench was of the type that you set the torque, and when you reach the target torque, instead of just a click, it would release and spin. And that pr prevents you from over-torquing the bolt. And so Drew put the torque wrench on, and it, it just spun. So I thought, no problem. I'll go get the torque wrench that has the higher setting. So I went down into a toolbox in the payload bay, got the wrench, gave it to Drew. He put it on still spun at the higher torque. And so that's not good because if you don't have that torque protection and you put a wrench on and you just turn it, what could happen, right? Well, the bolt could break. And if the bolt breaks, then bad things can happen, like the instrument comes out, but you can't put the new one in, and Hubble's dead, like forever. So that was bad. Okay, so this is the time I was not smiling. Um, now, fortunately, uh, so here we are. Floating. This is a view from the window in the back of the payload bay, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, here we go. I think I got it. It turned. It definitely turned. Yep, it turned. So I don't sound very excited, do I? So that was the Drew just using elbow grease to turn the bolt to see what happened. And so it turned, but we don't know whether it broke or it came undone. Now, fortunately, uh, we have the checklist, right? And the checklist says, you know, what do you do if the bolt doesn't turn? Well, the first step says, go get the higher torque wrench. And the second step says, uh, you know, call the ground and ask them what we should do. And so we called the ground. So this is, you're listening to Car Talk with Click and Clack, the Tappet Brothers. Go ahead, Florida caller. And I don't know why. Uh, you know, it's always been a mystery. Why do this cartoonist always describe uh, NASA people as old white guys with mustaches? <laughs> anyway, so, okay, here's my problem. But the point is we had literally hundreds of people on the ground who are experts in the telescope who were ready to respond and help us on orbit in case we had problems. Okay, so that was me saying, woohoo, it's moving out. <clears throat> it was tougher to do than we thought, but, you know, it, it has ended with just beautifully. Well, I've just lost five years of my life, I think. So that was the chief scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope, and, and that's part of the team that was on the ground helping us. Um, and it turns out that uh, one of the engineers went back through the data from the post-flight analysis, the 25 bucks you get uh, for doing your post-flight analysis, and found out that the t when they got to the ground in 1993, what do you do with torque wrenches? 
uh, periodically to know that they're still good. You calibrate them, right. And so when the mission got back in 1993, they calibrated the torque wrench and it was out of spec. And they knew the bolt was over tightened and they wrote a technical report and filed it away and we didn't learn about it until we got back. <laughs> Would have been nice to know that up front, right? So anyway, so we got that camera out. That allowed us to do more spacewalking. The next day, we put in new gyroscopes on the Hubble. That's one of the things that, that wears out. We put in new batteries, not uh, for those of you who are, how many of you are using 18650 cells in your payload, anybody? Oh, I see some hands go up, so yeah. They're not little double A cells. Um, they're nickel hydrogen batteries. They weigh about 400 pounds, uh, and, and they've been doing great. They've lasted, uh, you know, now, uh, for about half of Hubble's lifetime. Oh, and the death ray laser we carry in case we're attacked by aliens. Uh, that, that's Michael Goody's Air Force. You know, you got to bring a death. That's actually the power tool, power, power bolt driver that we use. Um, and one of the great things about Hubble is almost all of the bolts or the bolt heads are the same size. So we can use the same socket size. And this tool is calibrated so that you can program it for the the speed, the turns, the torque, and a little microprocessor records all of those values. So if you screw up on orbit, when you get back to the ground, somebody can check to make sure, you know, do quality control on your work. Um, one of the things we did was take out an old scientific instrument and put in a new one that had been put on in 1993. That is the, I talked about the corrective lenses they put in. Well, the corrective lenses were in this box. And now all the new instruments have that built in and so this is Drew Feustel taking out that old instrument. Weighs about 900 pounds. It's about the size of a big refrigerator. And uh, I convinced Drew to work out in the gym lifting weights every day for three years, telling him this thing would weigh that much. Um, and actually, that's, that was quite serious. We all did. And that's because of a couple of things. In the spacesuit, you know, we're in press a pressurized spacesuit working in a vacuum. It's about 4.2 pounds per square inch of pure oxygen. And so in the spacesuit, you're like the Michelin man. You know, you're, you're in a balloon. And so just to move your arm, uh, who knows the definition of work? It's, it's the integral of force times distance, or force times distance. So in order to move your arm, you have to apply a force over a certain distance. And it turns out that it's like lifting a 25-pound dumbbell just to rotate your arm, even if you're not holding anything. And so being in the spacesuit is like getting a, a really good workout. And if you're holding something that has a mass of equivalent of you know, 800 pounds, if you get it moving, it has momentum, and you've got to be able to stop it, too. And so you want to be strong enough so that you don't lose something like that uh, in space. And uh, so it's, it's actually a pretty good workout. So here's a, a video from uh, Drew's helmet cam. Hubble was designed with doors that open and close. And, you know, it was designed to be serviced by people. And that allowed us to change out these instruments. So here he is holding that instrument. Now, the next thing we did after this was to open up an instrument in the Hubble by removing tiny screws, little number four torque set screws, pulling out circuit boards and putting new circuit boards in. And this had never been done in space. A lot of folks told us, you know, in these big hockey gloves, we wouldn't be able to do that. So how do you take out tiny screws in space? Well, with a tiny screwdriver. Um, but actually, all I was doing was checking to make sure each of the screws could be loosened, that they weren't stripped or anything. And then we had this contraption that we put on top to capture all those screws between a clear plastic cover and the instrument itself. So you can see the circuit cards back there now. And if you look really closely, you can see screws floating around where they were captured. Now, the edge of the circuit boards are really sharp and could easily cut through the glove, so we had this weird tool that we developed to be able to pull the cards out. So fortunately, that was successful. Um, when the people who uh, work our operations checklist and things developed the checklist, they said they thought it would take about six and a half hours to do that repair. I said I thought I could do it in two and a half hours, and we train underwater, and I trained over and over again. I even had a little mock-up on my desk, and every night I would pull those tiny screws. And so we were able to finish it much faster than the ground thought. Here's our tools coming in. You can see I have a big grin on my face. I didn't quite meet the mark, but it was two hours and 32 minutes. So I was pretty happy. 
uh, that that had worked out. Uh, the next day, we continued our repairs on the telescope, fixing another instrument. And finally, on the fifth spacewalking day, uh, I put in a new fine guidance sensor with Drew. Uh, it's uh, about the size of a baby grand piano. That's what helps the telescope point. We put on new insulation on the outside of the telescope. We changed a battery, a couple of other small items, uh, and then released the telescope the next day. There, Megan put it on the arm, let go of it. And so here is the Hubble Space Telescope uh, drifting away. Um, as, uh, as you heard, uh, right before we let go of the telescope, while I was still spacewalking on the fifth day, I gave Hubble a little tap, a salute, and said, you know, have a good trip, and off Hubble goes. Now, once we got rid of the telescope, we'd kind of relax, have a meal together. It wasn't just work, work, work. I like to hang upside down like a bat, but for me, it doesn't look like I'm upside down at all. Uh, this is Drew making a tortilla chicken sandwich. I encourage you all to try this at home. Um, we use tortillas rather than bread because uh, tortillas don't create crumbs. Bread, early on in the program, they brought up sandwiches, and the bread would create a snowstorm of, of little bits of stuff, so we switched to tortillas. Let's see what else. Uh, that's a spicy shrimp cocktail. Um, you know, we have lots of Velcro, so stuff doesn't float around. My son, who actually was here in 2010, no, I think uh, 2005. My son was here in 2005, just a little tyke, uh, to, to watch the rockets launch and had a great time. But he asked me if I would take a picture of a ball of water floating in the cabin. So we squeezed out a ball, ball of water. And you know, always being the scientist, I said, oh, it's a lens. So I'm going to focus on the ball of water image rather than Drew. And of course, we know that a convex lens inverts and magnifies. His nose really isn't that big. And then I said, hey, get really close to it. And so, yep, sure enough, it's a good magnifying glass. Um, one of the great things about being in space is being able to look out the window. And this is a picture of a sunrise. And uh, you know, we're up at uh, around uh, 600 kilometers. Uh, 350 miles, and so that's our Earth's atmosphere. That's the Earth. Sun's come up, and that thickness that you can see there is about 100 kilometers tall, and we live in the bottom five kilometers. You know, so that's how thin and fragile our atmosphere is. Uh, we were delayed in space a couple of days because of bad weather in Florida. So for the rookies on the flight, we broke out the peanut M&Ms fed the fish. This is uh, actually Tang. We asked them when we got back, was that orange drink Tang? And they said, yes. Here's a ball of water. My good eating that there. We also did some physics experiments. This is the stability of rotation about uh, different axes and conservation of angular momentum. Now, while we were down doing serious physics work, the crew on the flight deck, uh, well, they were playing video games. So this is the Land of the Space Shuttle video game. And I, want, I actually filmed this, and, and after a few times, I said, well, I don't think I got the video very good. Can you do it again, Scott? Um, and it gives all the data about the landing parameters and everything. And actually, the video was just fine. I wanted him to practice a lot, because the next day, we were going to go, instead of to Florida, to California, to Edwards Air Force Base, and uh, got into our pumpkin suits again, our orange suits. Scott put on his California music. Megan said, get to work. And uh, we all got suited up. And about 5,000 miles away from our launch site, we did our deorbit burn. And after that, the space shuttle is just a glider. This is actually going through the atmosphere with the bottom of the space shuttle smashing into the atmosphere. Temperatures get up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And uh, you know, we're toasty cool inside. Finally, we see uh, Edwards Air Force Base, runway 22. We're at uh, 12,000 feet, doing about 300 miles an hour, 21 degrees nose down, just gliding to the launch site. And Scott Altman is hand flying the vehicle. At 300 feet, we put the landing gear down. And Scott flew us to a beautiful landing. Uh, the runway is two and a half miles long, uh, 200 feet wide. The parachute comes out. That's actually so the nose gear doesn't hit too hard. It really doesn't slow us down very much. And then Scott put on the brakes to slow us down about halfway down the runway. So we traveled around the Earth uh, 193 times, 
uh, about 5.3 million miles. We grabbed the Hubble, did five spacewalks, deployed the Hubble, um, and the big question is, did we fix the Hubble or did we break the Hubble? Now, I wouldn't have come back to Rockets for Schools if I'd broken the Hubble. You know, that'd be pretty embarrassing. So you know that we fixed it. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope is a black and white telescope. You probably didn't know that. And in order to get those amazing color images, we have a wheel that has different color filters in it, and we take pictures. Now, it's really no different than the cameras in your phone. What you don't know about your phone is that on the little chip that takes the image, it's not just one camera, it's three cameras, and sometimes four. And in front of each pixel on your detector, one resolution element, is a little filter, like a red filter, a blue filter, and a green filter, RGB, red, green, blue. Now with Hubble, we have lots of others that are science filters, like this one that sees hydrogen light. And then a computer in the Hubble, or on the ground, uh, but in your phone that's in the phone, stacks those on top of each other, and that's how we get the great pictures like the Hubble Space Telescope takes. So this is a picture of a galaxy, about 50 billion stars. It's a spiral galaxy. You can see the spiral arms. And those bright spots are where baby stars are being born. And there's probably a black hole in the middle. So the Hubble Space Telescope is working great, taking incredible pictures. This is a picture of a region of gas and dust in our own galaxy. You can see lots of stars. And this gas and dust is collapsing. And inside of the middle, you can't see it, is a baby star and probably a baby solar system. This is a picture uh, where the gas and dust has collapsed. The star is only a few million years old. Stars last for billions of years old, so we're capturing just that moment. And wouldn't it be great if we could see inside of this to know what's going on? And so one of the new capabilities on the Hubble is an infrared camera that allows us to see inside. So you can see the ghostly outline, and here's that baby star. And one of the things that some stars do when they, if they're spinning rapidly is once they get spun up, they kick out a lot of material. And so we can see that material coming out. And so that's the plane, the physical plane that the uh, planets are also forming in. This is just a preview of what the James Webb Space Telescope is going to do pretty much everywhere it looks. Now the Hubble is a great scientific instrument. It's told us about the birth and death of stars, black holes, the expansion of the universe. But one of the things the Hubble has done that I really appreciate, and I think is probably uh, its most significant contribution, is it takes really beautiful pictures. You know, it looks like abstract art, but this is the Great Nebula in Orion. And you should still be able to see it, but you know, Orion, the hunter, has a belt, three stars, yes? And it has a sword, three stars. Well, that middle star in the sword is not a star at all, but this nebula of gas and dust that's collapsing, and all throughout here are baby stars forming. This is a stellar nursery. And this is what our solar system looked like four and a half billion years ago. We were probably buried in one of these. Now, I'm a big fan of Mars. I saw lots of hands for Mars exploration. Um, and this is a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope of Mars. And you can see that it has an atmosphere. This happens to be a CO2 cloud. It has polar caps. Um, you know, really has everything that we need uh, to be able to live and not quite thrive, but struggle on Mars. And right now we have uh, the Curiosity rover and a project that I got started, the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter. How many of you have watched Ingenuity helicopter flights? If you haven't, go on YouTube and, and watch. You know, we are flying now, not routinely, but a couple of dozen times a helicopter on Mars. And when I uh, proposed this to NASA management, they said, no, we're not going to fly a helicopter on Mars. It's impossible. And that's just the kind of thing that gets me going, to say, well, actually, I, you know, I funded a project in a chamber at Jet Propulsion Lab where they flew a helicopter in a Mars atmosphere. I think we can do this. And they said, no, we can't fly a helicopter on Mars. It's impossible. And so I pressed and pressed, and fortunately, we got on the mission. Uh, and we were able to fly a helicopter on Mars. I call it a great Mars hack. Um, and so when I look at many of your rocket payloads, I think, oh, those are cool hacks. Those are cool rocket hacks. So you know, don't be discouraged if somebody tells you something's not possible.
December 25th, 2021, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. So Christmas this year, last year, we launched the James Webb Space Telescope. This is not the successor to Hubble, but another great observatory, and they're gonna work amazing together. The James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. It's not in a tube like the Hubble. It has a sun shield the size of a tennis court and a six and a half meter, 20 foot wide mirror to look in the infrared. Um, the launch was successful, the injection was successful. It's now almost a million miles from Earth uh, on the opposite side of the Earth from the sun. It's a very stable point. It's called Earth-Sun Lagrange Point 2. And it will spend the next couple of decades observing the universe in wavelengths we've never had before and resolution we've never had before. And so one of the hopes is that we're going to be able to see the very first stars and galaxies in the universe, baby stars, learn how the universe actually started to form. We're going to study planets around nearby stars, how galaxies are formed, and the birth of death of stars and planets. And the science should start coming out midsummer. So we're all looking forward to that. Um, the telescope was all folded up inside of the rocket fairing. And then, because six and a half meters, 20 feet, we don't have a rocket big enough. So we folded it up. But fortunately, it unfolded. And here's a picture of itself. I won't tell you how that was made. but. Here's the uh, 17 mirrors, and we focused all the in instruments, and so they're all working well. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to those results. I wish I could show you some of the early pictures. They're just not available yet. So congratulations. I walked around and looked at some of your rocket projects. Of course, everything here uh, is a, that I showed you is available on worldwideweb.nasa.gov. And um, so the next, I think, is go for launch. So let's do a 3-2-1 blast off. Three. Two, one. Anyway, thanks. I'm ready for questions. All right, we've got uh, about 15 minutes for questions here. So if anyone wants to ask a question, come on up over here. We'll pass to the microphones. Come. Time to talk to the astronauts. So I thought I saw a hand in the back. Come on up here. There we go. <clears throat> I don't bite. Don't be shy. Yeah. Come on out here. I have, a co I have a couple of questions. Okay, so how long did it take to fully recover from your space trips? So I did five space trips, and you know I remember on the first one, which was 17 days, coming back, I felt pretty strong. Um, you know. At, at landing and, and got up inside the cabin before the folks were able to open the door and, and let us out, but super heavy, like ridiculously heavy. Um, everything, just lifting an arm, it was like, oh, really? This, is, this sucks. Um, in fact, gravity sucks pretty much. <laughs> and, and I can tell you that the last three years, I've really wished I was in space. Um, but uh, we did a bunch of tests where I had to walk blindfolded, and there were all these styrofoam balls stuck to me, and so they got videos. All the crew, we were doing these experiments, because at that time, that was the longest uh, space shuttle flight. And that night I went to sleep, and when I woke up in the middle of the night for whatever reason, I felt like I was glued to the bed and couldn't move. But after about two weeks, I was back to normal. And then on each subsequent flight, it was faster and faster recovery. Now, what I find really interesting, though, is uh, getting to orbit. You know, it's, humans didn't evolve to float in space. You know, there's no, you know, environmental pressure that would cause us to know how to adapt to space. So on the early missions, you know, doctors were saying, oh, I'm, I'm talking like before we ever flew in space, uh, 1961, the medical community said, oh, humans won't be able to swallow in space. They'll die. Their eyeballs will pop out. I mean, ridiculous just ridiculous things. And they had all these reasons why we shouldn't send people to space. Poor Ham the chimpanzee. They really thought that, you know, when we sent Ham and Enos up, you know, what could have happened to them? Um, but, you know, they came back and had, had a nice life afterwards, and they were the first primate astronauts, you know, even before people. But first mission, it took me a, almost a week to be fully adapted to floating in space and comfortable. And then on the next mission, it was only a couple of days, 
And on the third mission, I would say maybe an hour. And on the fourth and fifth missions, my brain just said, oh, I know this, and snap. And so I think what's really amazing is that we can survive in free fall. And that gives me confidence that we'll do just fine on the moon and just fine on Mars. And you know, we have some crew members now on the International Space Station who go up for six months and they come back and their bones are actually stronger and their muscles stronger than when they left because we have a really good gym on orbit and they work out a lot. And so the, the big secret, NASA's, I don't know why NASA doesn't talk about this, but the key to health in space is not billions of dollars in research funding, it's diet and exercise. Who would have thought that diet and exercise is important to human health, right? So anyway, I encourage you to, to pursue a life, lifetime of, of good diet and exercise, which does include marshmallows. Second question. And then, uh, did space travel have an impact on your digestive system at all? Like, did you yes. see a difference? Yes. And I'm not going to go into any detail. No. No, yeah. Actually, um, a couple of things, one of which is that uh, moving solids, it's before lunch, right? I can talk about this. Um, yeah? Moving solids through your intestines, actually gravity plays a role, <laughs> right? So you wake up in, the, well, maybe you wake up in the morning and feel this way. I wake up in the morning and, you know, not too long after, you know, I got to poop, right? And part of that is the gravity, um, but also just, uh, and exercise, you know, moving the muscles squeezes stuff through. Um, so many people go up to space and they get very constipated. And part of it's dehydration, but part of it's that there's not that gravity vector pulling things down, you know, as you walk around, because you're not walking around. Um, so the, the medical community, the researchers say, oh, space flight causes constipation. And that's partly true. Um, but I did an experiment where for two weeks I ate just the food that they give us in space, but I was here on Earth. Guess what? Same thing. So, so really, it's the, if you eat a lot of freeze-dried food, and people who go camping and eat a lot of freeze-dried food know this, uh, that food tends to cause constipation. Sounds good. Thank you. So I got a question for you as we're picking up our next. There we go. Um, when you were in space did you, and you're doing your extra vehicle walks, did you turn off all of your electronics and everything and just be in space and listen to space? That's a great question. And you know, my intention on the last mission, I had a suspicion that that would be my last space flight because I knew we were turning the, the space shuttle off. Um, I wanted to turn off my radios. Now, inside the spacesuit, there's a sound you always want to hear, and that's the sound of the fan circulating air, because if that goes off, you know, that's a bad thing. Um, but I wanted to turn the radio off, and Drew Feustel, my partner, to turn his radio off to see if in a vacuum we touched visors whether we could talk through the vibration. Now, of course, in the suit you can talk, but once you get to a vacuum, there's no air, that, that means there's no sound. But I thought if we touched our visors, there would be transmission through plastic to plastic. And we were just so busy and focused on the task that I forgot to do it. Now, the ground would freak out, because not only would, when you turn off the radio, not only would they lose the sound, but they'd lose my heart rate data and the, all the suit uh, information and they'd go, oh, you know, John's suit just failed. We got to get him in. But I thought we could maybe do it in the airlock after we were done and I just forgot. Oh, bummer. It's yeah. kind of like an Apollo 13 thing here, just yeah. ripping off here. Uh, so my question is, how long did it take to get to the um, Space Hubble Station? Yeah. So from launch, it's only eight and a half minutes to Earth orbit. So that's really quick. So that's from zero miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour. But once we got to orbit, uh, the first thing we had to do is turn the space shuttle from a rocket ship into our home in space. So that takes a day um, on the space shuttle. And then we had to spend another day with the robotic arm inspecting the bottom of the shuttle to see if we had any foam damage. And in fact, we had about a fifth size piece of insulation missing from the bottom of the space shuttle because we did get hit by foam. So then the ground had to do simulations and tests to see if we were safe or if they had to launch the rescue shuttle. So that was a little disturbing. Um, but they cleared us and said, oh no, you'll be able to land okay. So then it was really the third day that we got to the Hubble. All right, another question. 
How did you go to the bathroom? <laughs> oh no, I just held it for, for 12 days. It's, it was kind of uncomfortable. No, um, you know, it's interesting you ask that because usually if I talk to a school group that's, you know, like elementary school, first graders, that's the first question they ask. Sometimes I've talked to seniors groups, you know, in their 70s and 80s. It's also the first question they ask. Um, but on board the sh space shuttle and on the space station, we actually have a toilet that's kind of like an airline toilet. It's a, you know, a little booth you go in um, or a privacy curtain. And the key to going to space and going to the bathroom in space is suction. We have a little fan that sucks air in. And so you pee into a tube. Uh, women have a uh, bigger funnel, men have smaller funnels, and the urine gets sucked into a tank. Um, the water and all the solids are separated, and on the space station we actually reuse, reuse that water. And uh, the solids go into a tank, and for the space shuttle we brought that home and, and it was cleaned out. And for the space station we put it into the progress uh, resupply vehicle and it burns up in the atmosphere. All right, there we all go. One more. So you already explained a little bit on how you guys are reusing the water up there. On how long does it take to make the water safe again for you guys to drink up there? If, if you want to watch an entertaining YouTube video, it's a few years old now, uh, you know, Google, you know, drinking NASA, drinking urine in space. There's a very funny uh, spoof that has an engineer at the Marshall Space Flight Center who's testing the first uh, test from our urine separator. Um, it turns out it's really hard uh, to take urine and generate in space clean water. And it's because, you know, it's not always known, but in, uh, in urine there are some solids and they tend to clog the filters that we use. Um, but in principle, you can turn urine into clean drinking water, you know, pretty quickly. You know, I mean, within an, you know, if you have a liter of urine, you should be able to get a liter of water within an hour. Um, what, uh, we've mostly used for drinking water is the humidity in the vehicle. You know, we breathe out water. Um, we've been collecting the humidity in a, hu in a condensate tank, and that's relatively clean water. And then we filter that, and that's used for the drinking water. And the uh, urine water is mostly used to, for electrolysis, separating the hydrogen and oxygen, um, which is, again, a purification step. And then we breathe that oxygen and the hydrogen is dumped overboard. Um, but there is a system where we get water that's pure enough that we can drink. We just haven't been doing that. When we go to Mars, we're going to have to recycle everything, you know, almost a completely closed system. And, and, you know, that's one of the keys is making a system that's reliable enough that it can last for a couple of years. All right. We've got our last question here for the, eve or for the day. How did you... Oh, sorry. Uh, how did you experience time passing in space? Pretty much the same as here on Earth, um, but it's a very in insightful question because at the speed I was going, because of general and special relativity, time was actually going slower on board the space shuttle than it, for people here on the Earth. So the faster you go relative to an observer who's not going fast, time goes slower. So it turns out over five missions, I'm about a millisecond younger than I would have been if I had stayed on the ground. Anyway, thanks, thanks for your questions. Good luck with your rockets. Right. And remember Kenny's rule number one, you know, be safe. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, John. Appreciate you being here again. Pleasure. Thank you. Notice as soon as the bathroom discussion happened, all the arms went up. So maybe you guys start with that next time. So thank you again, sir. All right, everybody, that is it for the morning program at this time. If you want to head to lunch early, go right ahead. But remember, be back by quarter after one, especially if you're a 1.30 team presentation. All right, thanks, everybody. See you in a little while.